today. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. We're going to read through verse 7, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul is writing one of his pastoral epistles to the younger Timothy who he left in charge in Ephesus. And so uh, we want to study that text today. 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. First of all, Paul writes, Then I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority, so we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. For this I was appointed a herald and apostle. I'm telling the truth. I am not lying and a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Let us pray. Father, as we look to your word today, speak to us, Lord, about what it means to be a citizen in this community and in this nation, in this world. Lord, we have not said this of ourselves, but you have said it of those who would follow you, that we are to be salt and light in our world and on this earth. Father, as we live in these days that are so challenging in so many ways, give us grace, give us wisdom, give us restraint, give us conviction. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Dwight D. Eisenhower said of our nation, and how each person should respond to it this. He said, freedom has its life, its hearts, or has its life rather in the hearts and the actions and the spirit of men. And so it must be daily earned and refreshed, else like a flower cut from its life-giving roots, freedom will wither and die. You know, as I think about our 244th birthday as a nation and that statement by former president, I ponder this question. How are we as Christians to live as citizens in these United States? What does it entail to refresh our nation? What could I do? The great thing is we're not left to ourselves in regard to this matter. In fact, Paul gives us a great answer in the first seven verses of 1 Timothy chapter 2. As I said, he's writing to the younger Timothy, and he's given instruction regarding the believer's citizenship. Now, Paul wrote 1 Timothy to the younger Timothy around 64 or 65 A.D. Uh, the world ruler at that time was a man named Nero. Timothy was placed in Ephesus by Paul, and he was given the charge of instructing the churches there. And so he writes as a mentor, Paul does, to Timothy, giving practical instruction for this young minister. In the midst of this epistle, though, that is so famous for its guidelines and church polity and church organization and structure, we see in the midst of this, Paul writes about the Christian's individual responsibility in society. Jesus had already earlier made it clear that believers are to be salt and light in this world. And so along the same vein, we see that Paul is speaking about the impact that we as believers are to have in our world. And I want to look at these two specific areas that Paul addresses today. If we're going to make a difference in our community, in our state, our nation, our world, then we need to follow this outline, really, that Paul is giving to us. The first thing is this. We are to pray for others. In chapter 1, verse 3, Paul speaks to a problem in the church at Ephesus. Timothy was really placed there, in a sense, not only to instruct the church, but to protect the church. To protect, to protect the church, we see in chapter 1, verse 3, from individuals who were teaching a different doctrine. This negative group is really nameless in this epistle, but there are clear uh, hints as to what they were doing. We know that there was a, a Jewish influence, not that the Jews were bad, but in this case there were certain uh, Jewish people who were trying to limit the advancement of the gospel to the Gentiles. They were so focused on uh, Jewish regulations that it was hindering the advancement of the gospel. 
there was also an early form of Gnosticism that was affecting the church there. Now, Gnosticism did not really come into full fruition until the 100s BC, and this was before that. But we see some early characteristics that sort of were very similar to Gnosticism. In fact, uh, Paul closes this epistle, and I think the penultimate verse in chapter 6 and verse 20, where he really warns about those who had a special knowledge. And so Gnosticism came from the word uh, gnosis, the Greek word, which had to do with knowledge. And again, the idea was this. There were certain ones in the church who felt they were special. They had an exclusive knowledge of God, and it led them to be an exclusive group. Not only that, but they considered all matter really to be evil. And so in chapter 4, the first few verses, we see the asceticism or the denial that they were uh, trying to point forward, which was really hindering the work of grace in the church there. And so as we look at these two influences, this uh, Jewish influence that was seeking to hinder the gospel from advancing to the Gentiles and this uh, Gnostic, early Gnostic uh, influence that was seeking to uh, say that there are only certain people who have special knowledge, you can see the threat in the church at Ephesus was this. There was a separatist mindset. They insulated themselves from society. They thought they were special. They were exclusive. We might say in our terms today, they were like a country club church. And this greatly burdened Paul. It burdened him so greatly that he addressed specifically the issue by using inclusive terms in these seven verses. For instance, he spoke that, that petitions, prayers, intercessions are to be made for everyone, that it also was to be made for all those in authority. He says that God's desire is that everyone be saved in verse 4. And then in verse 6, he says that Jesus gave his life as a ransom for all. These words were not just thrown in there without thought, but Paul was speaking to a church that was really inward looking, and he was trying to emphasize to them the outward aspect of the gospel ministry. Well, what is our role as Christians in society? We're not to hide beneath our walls of protection or security. We're to engage. We're to have a heart for our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. And this begins with prayer. We can do more than prayer, but we cannot do more without prayer. Prayer is the greatest instrument that we have. Do you realize that? For our nation right now, there is nothing more powerful than fervent prayer. And Paul mentions two categories of prayer here. We are to pray first general prayers for all people. Notice what he says there. He uses four words in our prayers for everyone, a general prayer for all people. The three of the words are very similar. Petition is an appeal made out of a general sense of need. Prayer is really the most general word for prayer used in the Bible. Intercessions uh, it points to an element of insufficiency for God to intervene on behalf of the petitioner, on behalf of others. And so in this, we see first that we are to pray for others. We can talk to others. We can try to argue and convince others, but we really need to be talking to God on behalf of others. And our prayers are be, to be accompanied by thanksgiving. Most recently, we have been reminded of our nation's transgressions, and to be honest, there are many. And as we think about that, though, we live in a nation that's been blessed by God. We, we live in really a God-honored nation I would say, argument, for sake of argument, there has not been a nation more blessed other than maybe the nation of Israel than our nation, not based on merit, but by God's favor. Whenever I've been in uh, another nation, and I've been in five different continents in my life, mostly on mission work, when I arrived back, this last time I, I came back last summer, I literally 
wanted to kiss the ground. I mean, I was at an airport. I probably would have looked like a fool, but there was an unction in me that I was so thankful to be back in this nation. And so as we pray, we're to be thankful. We're to be thankful for the freedoms that we have. Paul, though, is calling us as believers to move beyond ourselves. Not just praying for myself, my family, my needs, my church, my circle. Those are all to be included. But every mature believer is to pray beyond himself. Not just for the sick he may know, not just for our family members, but for the nations. For God's kingdom to advance. You might ask, how can I pray for everyone in the world? You can't. It's, it's not possible. There are not enough hours in the years or in the decades. But you can cultivate a heart that prays large. By that, I mean a heart that prays beyond what you see. One thing that I've recently tried to do as I prayed for the world is to lift the six inhabitable continents. Now, the seventh one is really not inhabitable. I don't think anyone has a citizenship in Antarctica. I saw where there may be 1,000 to 5,000 people that stay, stay there for a brief time. They probably work for National Geographic or something like that. But among the six inhabitable continents, I pick out a day, Monday through Saturday. Yesterday was my time to pray for Australia. And, and for those continents that have multiple nations, you may pray for Europe, but then you'll include Germany, Great Britain, France. You see where I'm going. We begin to pray. Even if we don't know missionaries, we pray for those who are doing God's work. And so we need to pray for everyone, but we're also to pray for our political leaders. Notice verse 2. We're to pray for kings and for all of those who were in authority. Now, the king in that day equated, really, with our president. And, and those in authority would be all others, those in the president's cabinet, those who were members of Congress, our state leaders, um, and uh, our state Congress, our local leaders, all of these who are given charge over us. The Bible says we're to pray. Notice it didn't say complain. It said pray. We're living in divided political times. And God is not a Democrat, nor is he a Republican. He's neither one. And, and sometimes we think if we can just get the politics right, everything will be right. But that's like fixing something and just patching it up, not giving it a real fix. The only fix for this nation is Jesus Christ. You know, I think it's interesting that we live uniquely we, we live in a state where there's a governor, the, the chief executive is of one party, and the president, the chief executive, is another party. And often we look at the other person as the enemy, and we complain. And complain is bad. To complain is bad. It doesn't make a positive difference. And actually, the Bible tells us that complaining is a sin. Paul speaks against it in Philippians. Instead, we're to pray. We're to pray even for a person with whom we disagree. We're to pray for someone that we would attribute all of the uh, attributes of evil to. We're to pray for that. It is so important for us to understand the political climate in which Paul wrote these words. Nero was the emperor. You say, well, that doesn't mean very much to me. Well, let's put ourselves in Paul's situation as he was writing. Nero hated Christians. Nero legislated against Christians. He blamed them. One of the most infamous sayings of that day was this, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. You heard that. Most historians say that Nero intentionally set fire to Rome, allowed it to burn so that it could be destroyed so that he could build his own palatial structures. That was bad enough being the instigator and not taking the blame. But guess who he blamed? He blamed Christians. And many Christians were executed at the hands of Nero. And so Paul is writing, and he's telling the church, pray for your leaders. And I would argue from the greater to the lesser that if Paul would tell Ephesus to pray for a man as vile 
and is hating toward Christians is Nero. That does not give us a pass for us to pray for our leaders. We need to pray for the nations and for our leaders, but that's not enough. Not just enough to have a world view to pray for the nations, to pray beyond ourselves. Not just enough to pray for our leaders, which we're to do. And I pray that you're praying for our president and our governor even now in these days. But also, we're to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our goal. That's our mission. Paul begins, really, as he looks in this discussion. Anyway, in verse 3, he says, It's good and pleases God, our Savior. But what pleases him? He speaks of the believer's lives. That our lives are to be a platform to share the gospel we're to make the gospel attractive. Some of you guys out there who are married, you remembered when you tried to get your wife's attention, you probably were very attuned to proper personal hygiene. I've said colognes were really made for first dates. You did everything you could. You may not have had much to work with, but you did everything you could to make yourself presentable. Why? You wanted to gain the favor of that one to whom you were attracted. In the same way, we're to gain the favor of individuals so that they might hear the gospel of Christ. If we're negative all the time, if we're going around and spewing hatred and spewing anger and, and retaliating and responding, that's not attractive. That's not the Christian life. Notice what he says there, that we might lead in verse 2, a tranquil and a quiet life in all godliness and dignity. All of these attributes are attractive attributes of the Christian faith, and they reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's not enough. Not one person is saved by your works or my works. That's not why we seek to live godly lives before people. No, we're to point others to Jesus. I like what the late Adrian Rogers said. He said, you and I are like the donkey that took Jesus into the holy city. We carry his message, even as the donkey carried him, the people are glorifying and praising him. We're merely just carriers of the message. When we live such a way, it pleases God. In other words, when we live with a view toward the world, a heart to pray for people, a, a tranquil and a godly and a quiet life, it's very pleasing to God. That's not what I say. That's what God's word says to us. I wonder today, you live your life with that aim, with that intent. We're to pray for others, our leaders included. We're to live attractive lives, but we're not to stop there. We must proclaim Jesus Christ. We must share him with others. There's a time when we must stand for political truth. There's a time when we as Christians need to stand for social justice. Even Jesus stood for social justice. He was a friend to the underdog. But the most important way we can impact our society is not politically or socially. It is by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the only fix that is eternal. Every other fix is a temporal fix. I want to look at three things in light of this truth of how the gospel is the answer. First, I want you to note with me, God desires that everyone be saved. Notice verse 4. God wants everyone to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Paul was not the only apostle to articulate this truth. Peter said so in 2 Peter 3, 9. He said that God is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God cares for lost people. When we see people that are acting, we consider to be in an unbecoming way, we should have a heart to say, God, have mercy on them. In the spirit of a Stephen, who when people were even stoning him, was saying, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. Jesus, when he was being tormented and when he was being taunted, had a heart to pray for others. God desires that everyone be saved. Now, not every person will be saved. But this is not because God doesn't care. Jesus came to be a ransom for all. Right before the pandemic arrived, I challenged us 
as a congregation to have a top 10 list. These would be individuals that we pray for would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You need to pray for this list regularly. You need to be faithful to share. I'm thankful to say that uh, of my 10, I, I recently had one of the 10 who's come to a saving knowledge of the Lord. There's still nine more. I pray that you're fervently praying for people you know who are lost. God desires that everyone be saved, but I want you to see a second truth in regard to the gospel. There's only one way that a person can be saved. People without Jesus face an eternity in hell, a place of eternal suffering. Think about that day after day after day after day in torment, crying out in pain, in darkness, in fire, in bitterness, in regret. We shouldn't want anybody to experience that. God loves all people and he doesn't want this separation and so God acted. Notice what it says. Verse 5, there's one God and there's one mediator between God and humanity, the man Jesus Christ. In other words, God in the flesh, God came in the person of Jesus and he died so that people might not face an eternity in hell that they might be saved. Jesus is the answer. We have recently come through a 10-week study in the Ten Commandments. Not one of those commandments will save you. And not one of us here can keep the Ten Commandments. That's not the purpose of the Ten Commandments. The purpose of the Ten Commandments is to show us God's standard and also to drive us to the grace of God through Jesus Christ. But the message that we have for society as that God has done what man could not do for himself. In my pocket, I have a set of keys, and many times I will uh, come across the yard here to get into church. Only one key among the ten that I have fits in this door. Every other one is a futile attempt to try to open the Bible says there's one God and there's only one way. There's no other way. There's only one person who fits as the answer and his name is Jesus Christ. And he gave himself as a ransom for all. That speaks to a payment on our behalf. He paid with his life, with his death, the penalty that should have been charged to us. And that's the good news. So God loves all people and he's provided the way but here is where it comes home to you and me. We're to carry the gospel to our neighbor and to the nations. Verse 7, Paul says that he was appointed a herald and an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles in saints. God has acted. Now we need to act. Paul was a herald. In these days when we celebrate our, our nation's birth, we're reminded of our great Harold Paul Revere, who wrote and proclaimed a message. The message that Paul has is the Messiah of the world has come, and the message that we have is that he is coming again. When a person becomes a follower of Jesus Christ, he or she also becomes a herald, a proclaimer of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, as he's speaking about uh, the inclusiveness of the gospel, says that he's a teacher of the Gentiles in faith. That is Another word for the nations. We're called to take the gospel in our community and in the nations. We as a church, we have to continue to have a heart for the nations. We need to be a sending church. We need to be a multiplying church. We need to be praying that God would raise up young people in this church that might serve God all over this world. And in our own lives, we need to share the gospel. You know, Adoniram Judson, the great missionary at that time to Burn, Burma, which is now Myanmar, upon reflecting on his future accountability before the Lord at the time of his death, breathed, breathed these words. Tell me, how could I, in the hereafter, I mean, face God's charge? I gave you one opportunity to tell them of me and you spent it painting your own adventure. Well, that's indicting. What type of citizen are you? Are you painting your own picture, your own political views, your own social causes, or are you proclaiming 
the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to be painting his picture. Praying. Proclaiming. Living a life that's attractive that people might come to know him. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, we thank you for your grace through Jesus Christ. Lord, Jesus is the answer to every situation. Forgive us, Lord, when we move our eyes away from the task of praying for others and proclaiming you to others. Lord, I pray that you would stir our hearts in regard to those that we're praying for. Ten, Lord, that you've placed on our heart. Lord, help us to be faithful and expectant. Lord, may we be in prayer not only for our community, but, Lord, for this nation, for its leaders, for the world. And, Lord, may we be faithful to support those who are proclaiming your gospel. May we be found faithful until you come again and receive us unto yourself. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to